Hello guys, this video is about free body force diagram, a systematic simple method to show the forces acting on an object. There are some rules to draw free body force diagram. Let's learn them first and then we will delve into problem solution to consider different cases to learn it. First, the diagram is for one body only and the force vectors are represented as arrows. One body means that if you have even 10 objects in interaction in a system, we just focus on one of them and then the other and then the other. So for a system including 10 objects, we will have 10 free body force diagrams, one by one separately. Second rule is only the forces acting on the body are considered. So anyway, let's learn like this. You are in interaction with a box. You are pushing a box, okay? Actually, when you push the box, also the box will push you back according to the Newton's third law. We have action and reaction. If you are considering just the box, you should consider only the action, the force you act on the object, not the reaction. And if you are considering yourself as another part of the system, normally you should indicate the force acting on you. Let's say it's negative F. So F is the, the action and the negative F is the reaction. Uh, regarding the object of interest, the object you focus on, you should draw just the forces acting on that, not the other. The third rule is the force vector arrows are drawn to a scale. Drawn to a scale means that if one of them is larger than the other, you should check them. You should consider the larger uh, arrow for the larger force. Originating at a point that represents the center of mass of the body. So we will always consider a force regardless of the shape, size, color. Forget about them. All the objects, even a very huge airplane, will be a, will be a point for us. And this point is the center of mass. Then we will draw some forces originating at that point. Let's say this is a force like that, the other force like that, the other force like that. All forces are arrows labeled arrows starting from that point so tail of the vector is at the point of the center of mass at the point of interest and then we draw them to a scale the last rule is label as i told you each force must have its own label now let's consider a very simple case an object suspended from ceiling we have an object like this it's suspended we are a rope from the ceiling Okay, it's at rest. We expect the object to be at rest. So all the forces acting on that will have a net resultant force of zero. What are the forces acting on that? Inevitably, we have always a, an ever existing downward force of gravity, downward force of mg or w. The other will be the canceling force, which is the tension of the rope acting on that object to cancel the weight. I will draw them to a scale. T must, be, must have an equal size to W, not larger, not smaller, because the object is at rest. So regardless of the shape, size, and everything, the object will be a point for us at the center of mass of that, that object, and then we consider the forces acting on that. Let's go to the next question. A boat floating on water. This boat is floating on water. I mean, it is at rest. And the total net force again is zero. Here we have almost a similar case as the previous one. A downward force of W and buoyancy force. Buoyancy force is FB here. The label is FB, whatever you want. And this FB is the force that can cancel the W, must cancel the W to hold the boat over the sea. The next question. A ball falling freely under gravity with no air resistance. We have no air resistance, so the ball is falling down. Falling down because of the downward force of gravity, W. Do we have any other force? No. If we consider no air resistance, there is no drag force acting on that. So this is the only W downward force that we can consider for that object. The next case would be a ball falling freely under gravity with air resistance. So there is an air resistance against the downward motion. If the W is acting on that, 
there must be a force against that. Let's say it's FD, drag force. How big the drag force could be or should be? Normally, we believe that the object could have a very could could be acted by a very huge FD, which can easily cancel the W, or maybe very small. At the beginning of the free fall, usually the drag force is very small, so it's not that considerable. So we cannot cancel the W. We expect a downward acceleration of A because W is larger than FD. It's at the beginning of the motion, but as the as the uh, as the time goes on and the object is accelerating and accelerating and speeding up, the FD is highly affected by velocity. The larger the velocity, the more the FD. Finally, the object will get a terminal speed. Terminal speed at which FD has the same size as W, so it can cancel the W. Here we have no acceleration. So. How can we draw the FD, how big it could be? It depends on the case. At the beginning or beginning moments of the motion, FD is not that big. So it's smaller than W. But when the object gets the uh, terminal speed, the acceleration is zero. So FD has the same size as W. An object on a ramp. Here I have an object on a ramp. And let's say the ramp is strong enough to hold the object. An object cannot break it. And it may slide down with acceleration, it may go down with constant speed, or maybe at rest. It, it, it's not important for the time being for me. I'm going to have a diagram for free body. Uh, let's uh, put a point here as a representative of that object, regardless of shape and size. And then I start drawing the force. One of them is the downward force of W. It's always downward. The other is the normal force. I will have a normal force which can hold the object on the ramp. Let's say it's N. So I draw N. N is always normal to the ramp. The other is the um, opposing force of uh, uh, friction. You know the friction is against the motion. The motion is expected to be down the ramp, but if the friction is like this, it may be strong enough to hold the object and impede the acceleration. It may be not that big, so it may accelerate down, but the friction is uh, somehow canceling part of that component of the W. Actually, the W will have a component like that. Let's say it's W1, the component which is pulling the object down the ramp, and the other is the W2, the component of W which is pushing the object on the ramp, to the ramp. The normal force will necessarily cancel the W2, but if the friction is canceling W1 or no, depends. I don't want to decompose, and it's not necessary to decompose any of the forces, so it's just that some detail, extra detail I'm telling you, it's not important. I'm just telling you how the object may accelerate or maybe at rest or constant speed. In future, I will consider the ramp in detail, so it's not important for the time being. Just keep in mind that there are always the three forces acting on an object when it is on a ramp. The next is a person pushing against the wall. I am here, I'm pushing the wall leftward, so I'm considering the forces acting on me. So the object of interest is this person. I put a point here as a representative of that person. The other uh, is the setting of a force. Downward force of W. The other is the normal force. Let's say it's N2. N2 is the normal force uh, actually canceling the W. N2 must be drawn to a scale exactly the same equal size of W to cancel that because we know that the person is at rest and it won't accelerate vertically or horizontally so n2 must have the same size as w the other is the reaction force of the wall if you push the wall with a force of n1 the wall actually will push you back this is the reaction force acting on your body should i also uh, show n1 here this n1 acted on the wall no it's not important because i am just considering the person the free body diagram for the person so this N1 is enough for me. And the last is the friction. Actually, the person relies on the friction 
to hold himself at rest. If there is no friction, you cannot push the wall. And if you do that, the wall will, you, will push you back and you will accelerate rightward. Because of that, I believe if the object, if the person is at rest, there is a friction against that acted from the ground to the person and it will have the same size as N1 to cancel it. And because of that, this, the, the person here, this point, will be at rest with no acceleration. The next case is aircraft when flying. Let's say the aircraft is flying and it's in the air and it doesn't have any acceleration, okay? It's just moving on to the, to the horizontal and it is not ascending, descending, slowing down, speeding up, nothing. Uh, actually, there are four forces always acting on the airplane when it's flying. One of them is the downward force of W, always. The other is the lift force, it's due to the shape of the wings and aerodynamic of the airplane. Uh, if the lift cancels the W, the, the airplane has a constant altitude. If the lift has larger size compared to W, it will ascend and it will, it, it, if it has a smaller size regarding W, it will descend. I don't want to show the lift uh, in larger or smaller size. You can adjust it according to the question. This question is just considering the case at which the airplane has no acceleration. Uh, the other will be the thrust force, which is the force of engine, and it's uh, always acted by a leftward drag force against the thrust force. To and drag thrust, uh, drag uh, always uh, tries to cancel the thrust force. If it's, if it's large enough to cancel the thrust force, the airplane gets a constant speed. And if the, the pilot accelerates the uh, airplane rightward, the thrust force must be larger than drag. It depends. And sometimes the pilot deliberately reduces the thrust force. And so the drag force will overcome the thrust and the net force will be leftward and the airplane will slow down when it approaches the, uh, the, the airport. Okay, anyway, you will adjust the, the four forces uh, regarding the case, which one is larger and which one is uh, smaller. The next force, the next uh, case is the forces acting on the on the object in a lift in the elevator. Let's say first there is a box in an elevator. The object here is moving upward or downward with constant speed. It's very important, constant speed, or you can consider it to be at rest. They are the same thing. The reason is that the object at rest or moving with constant speed all uh, are out of an acceleration. The acceleration is zero. So we will uh, apply the Newton's first law of motion. The forces acting on this object, this is the object. I put a point as usual, and then this is the setting of the force. Uh, first downward force of W, and the other is the upward force of N. N is the normal force acting on the box. Which one is larger? None of them. They are equal. The reason is that the object has constant speed or at rest. So acceleration is zero. Necessarily, I believe that the normal force will have the same size as W. But you may consider the case of elevator in which the object or the system is accelerating upward. It's very important. There are the same couple of forces acting on the object, but as the system or the object is accelerating offward, it's very important to draw the normal force larger than W. The reason, because the normal force must be larger than W to have upward acceleration. So actually, the net force, vertical net force, is not zero and is going to be upward. Let's say it's F net to be N minus W to provide that acceleration. The other case is uh, the one at which the elevator is accelerating downward. Again, we will have the same setting of the forces, but in this case, W is larger than N. The reason, the object is accelerating downward. So the net force, which is W minus N, will be downward. 
This is why in elevator, we always care about the acceleration. If the acceleration exists, we should care about the larger force to the same direction as the acceleration is. The last is this case, a couple of objects in contact pushed by a horizontal force on a frictionless surface. Let's say we have a couple of objects like M1 and M2. They are acted by a horizontal force of F. And I'm going to have free body diagram for M1 and another free body diagram for M2. I will draw them one by one. First, M1. I put a point here as the representative for M1. And I draw the forces acting on that. First is the horizontal rightward force uh, of push. Push the system, push, pushing the system. This is F. The other will be a reaction force acted on M1. You know, M1 and M2 are in contact, so they will have a contact force. The contact force will push M2 rightward, and the reaction will be acted on M1 leftward. They are equal but opposite. I will draw them like that, this one like that, and leftward. Okay? This is the reaction force acted on M1. The other two forces, remaining two forces, are downward force of W. Let's say it's W1, labeled for the weight of M1. And the other is the normal force N1, which can and will cancel W1. N1 has the same size as W1. But this F must be larger than N. The reason, because M1 will accelerate. Why? Because the system is accelerating. How do you know that? The reason is clear. Look at the system as a whole. Let's say the system is here. The whole system is acted by a horizontal rightward force of F. Forget about the vertical forces because they cancel each other. And there is no impeding force. We have no friction. So no friction means that resultant force is rightward. So system will have acceleration. So for sure, M1 also is accelerated. Because of that, we know that F is larger than N. The other will be another point representing M2. M2 is acted by three forces. One of them is, as I mentioned, the uh, contact force of N, uh, which is acted uh, on M2 from M1. The other will be the vertical downward force of W, labeled for the weight of M2, and the other, the canceling force of N2, which is the normal force acted on M2. N2 will have the same size as W2, and this N will accelerate the M2. That's all. Thank you very much for being with me. I hope you enjoyed this lesson. Take care. See you in the next video.